Hi, and welcome to the 12th House Podcast, where we make the unseen seen and pull the curtain back on all the areas of life that are mysterious and, dare I say, shadowy. Things like mysticism and magic and intuition and well-being and, I don't know, just like being a person in this world. I'm Michelle, the founder and head witch in charge at Holisticism, and today's episode is all about shadow work. (laughs) It's very exciting. I have my esteemed colleagues, Janelle and Wallace, with me today talking about shadow and I fucking love shadow. Obviously as the person who wanted to have a podcast called the 12th house, which tends to be the house that most people are like, do not want to touch in astrology. The 12th house represents death and everything that has mystery wrapped around it and intuition and psychic abilities and darkness. It's a shadowy place because it's scared and I love that shit. It might be my Scorpio moon talking or my love of true crime, but I think that the most interesting things are just lurking in our shadows, whether it's societally or personally or spiritually. And when I first learned about shadow work a couple of years ago, when I first moved to LA, it was served up to me in a way that that worked just fine at the time. But as I've grown to study it more and understand it, and work through it myself in lots of different ways, and I'm by no means perfect at it, no, by any stretch of the imagination, I just learn more and more about how little I know about shadow work, I'm blown away by how much it can change the way that we operate in the world, and I'm really excited to talk about this topic with you today. So if you're itching to get into the shadow work, you can fast forward a couple minutes as we go through a couple of Quick little housekeeping things for holisticism. If you're listening to this episode the day that it drops on December 22nd, 2020, we have our last free class all about impact. I've taught three free classes this month on the roadmap to profitability and purpose in 2021. And each class had a different theme. The first one was on growth. The second was on revenue. The third one was focusing on retention and regeneration. And today's class is on impact. And we look at these four pillars at holisticism as the four pillars of intuitive business. But I also think that these four pillars work really well for the areas of your life that you want to work in. Impact is something that tends to get (laughs) looked over and ignored when it comes to the business world. And here we're experimenting and exploring what it might look like to prioritize impact as much as we prioritize revenue and growth and retention, especially as a for-profit business. And what could that look and feel like for us as a team and as a community? And how would that change how we operate in the world? So I'm really excited to talk about and teach how to create goals in this area and how to start thinking about it and building it into your work as opposed to having your impact or your legacy be an afterthought. And it's going to be really fun. These classes are all free. You can go ahead and sign up at the link in our show notes. If you want to join today's class, it's at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And all you have to do is RSVP. You'll get an email about attending class and I will see you there. If you can't join us live, sign up anyways. I send a replay out to everyone who joins and I can't send it to you unless I have your email. So if you want to get that replay, just go ahead and sign on up and I'll see you in class. And one other thing to note, in today's podcast, we referenced the North Node a ton, so you're going to hear about it a little bit, but in case you're brand new to Holisticism or to the 12th House podcast, the North Node is our private members community for intuitive entrepreneurs and leaders. It's a place where we pick a theme every single month to dive deeper with our community of hundreds of amazing, incredible, just like genius human beings, where we teach intuitive business concepts and ideas, and we marry mysticism, magic, activism, and following your intuition alongside pragmatic and practical business savvy. It's a really cool, amazing group of people. I think I've said amazing a jillion times already today, but I'm always blown away by them. And we only open up the doors to the North Node twice a year, once in the very end of December and once in July. And the doors actually open next week on December 28th, which is really exciting, and they'll only be open for a couple of days. But we reference the North Node in this podcast because 
we actually did a whole month on shadow work in the North Node, complete with exercises, and it was deep but amazing. And Janelle also mentions past life regression, and we have an entire module on past life regression, including a past life regression hypnosis that you can do yourself in the North Node. So just a heads up that the doors open next week, that there's so many goodies in there beyond what you might expect from an intuitive business community or group that I'm just really delighted and, and proud to present. And I can't wait to dive into our January content and show you what we're up to. So if you want to learn more about the North Node and you want to be first on the list for when we open the doors, you can sign up for our wait list at holisticism.com backslash north dash node. All right. And I think that's pretty much it for today's episode intro. This is a kind of a long one, but we have a worksheet that goes along with today's podcast episode. That is the first shadow work exercise that you can try out if you're brand new to this and you can grab it at holisticism.com backslash shadow. Okay. With that, we're going to jump into the podcast and I really hope you enjoy it. Shoot me a text and let me know what you think at the number in our show notes. And I will see you on the internet. All right. Hi, team. Welcome to talking about shadow work. I've got Wallace here. Hello. And Janelle. What's up, (laughs) y'all? Excited. (laughs) So I think that we can say across the board at Holisticism, we love shadow work, but we are also scared by it. Would this be correct? A hundred percent. I think... Yes. Well, I'll say for me, it was less at the beginning. I was really just confused by it. <laughs> I really was just like, so my shadow, what is it? And what am I supposed to do with it when I figure it out? And is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And so I think initially the fear is really just like the unknown and feeling like it plays such a big role in who you are and how you navigate, but not knowing how to navigate it. Totally. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you on that. I think it's, I am primed for new shadow work. And I think the first time that I did it, there was a lot of everything is shadow. And then you kind of <laughs> overdo it and you're like, that shadow, that shadow, that shadow. And then you kind of negate some of your feelings because you're like, oh, mm-hmm. so I'm ready to do it again. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect segue because shadow work is something that you can do over and over and over again. It's a never ending story. And yeah, just like anything, just like wellness, like in general, right. Or eating healthy. Like we tend to overdo it at first when we're getting used to it and acclimated to it. But as you understand it more deeply and how it works in your life, it's a lot easier to navigate, I think. So we kind of like buried the lead on this, but shadow work is a practice of sort of looking at the aspects of yourself that you haven't allowed to come to the surface because society deems them unlovable, basically unacceptable. And we're going to use the term shadow work because it's really popular in the wellness space and in the sort of spiritual space. And like the sort of, we're going to talk about the modern version of shadow work and how you can do it and practice it in your life and why you would want to, because maybe we totally just scared you off from it. <laughs> but I would say <laughs> like exploring your shadow is one of the most like life changing things that you can do in a positive way. Thais yesterday when we had our team meeting, she like basically yelled, <laughs> shadow work changed my life. And it's true. Like that's what it can bring you to. But it's also really intimidating because it's something that in Western society, we don't, we don't talk about a lot. Yeah, not yeah, yeah, at all. It's so funny. I had a very similar experience of Wallace when I first started shadow work a few years ago where everything just became overwhelming. And more than just looking at everything in a shadow, I just tried to analyze every single thing that happened. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. That's so exhausting too, yeah, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So with shadow work, I... I'm now finding myself in a space where I'm realizing that I have to do another layer because I'm in a relationship mm-hmm. now. So it's a different kind of shadow work. And I'm being faced with yeah. the shadow, with like my shadow, like I've never been faced with my shadow before. And yeah, shit is real. <laughs> I <difficult>. mean, <laughs> my, my relationship just ended because, you know, oh. many reasons, but I think 
Mm. A huge part of that is us just projecting our shadows onto each other and so subconsciously trying to work it out, but not always having the tools and, you know, it's still fresh. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of reflections, but one of the biggest ones that I had coming out of it right off the bat was, oh, we're just really mirrors of course, we're always mirrors for each other in every relationship, but we're such intense mirrors for all of our really deep shadow work right now. <laughs> That's real shit. Yeah. I mean, I'm it's a, like the first two yeah. minutes of the podcast and we went there, so. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> this is where it was always destined to go. <laughs> yeah. I think all of the emotions are there and raw. So mm-hmm. I'm sorry to hear about that. Well, as I know, that is like, not fun at all yeah. but I also understand I'm in the thick of it right now I don't know where my relationship is going to end up right now in this moment and I am doing a lot of shadow work and yeah and just recognizing how a lot of my humanists and my traumas and those shadows bump up against my partner's shadows and his humanists and his mm-hmm. traumas and it's also interesting when like I hate saying this but when it like I'm very aware of that work that I'm doing and my partner isn't necessarily consciously doing that work, you know, or like even aware yeah. that that work needs to be done. And so, yeah, it's a difficult thing to navigate specifically in relationships. I think, again, I, this is my first ever relationship. So I'm learning that I'm just learning a lot. <laughs> I'm just learning a lot. <laughs> but I'm learning that, yeah, there, the, and yeah, we are absolutely mirrors and reflections of each other that I have never been more like seen more of myself in a relationship ever in my life. And it's frightening and it's hard. Yeah. And I ain't got nothing else to say about that. It's frightening and hard. (laughs) Yeah, dude. I mean, Carl Jung is kind of the, I don't want to call him the father of shadow work, but who modernized shadow work as we kind of know it says shadow is the person that you'd rather not be. And so because our relationships, our work, everything, how we show up in the world is mirrored back to us when we continue to see the, our shadow, who is the person that we'd rather not be, it's really, it's really overwhelming, especially because I don't know about you guys, but in romantic relationships, I want to be the best, right? I want to be the best version of myself. I want that person to see the best version of me, but that's not love, dude. <laughs> or like, that's not real love. That's not like authentic. That's not someone seeing you. That's just them seeing the like nice tied up in a bow version of you. And real love is like seeing someone's shadow and seeing someone's light and being like, both are beautiful. And I love both sides of them. And I'm not trying to obliterate shadow. I'm just shining a light on it. I don't want it to go away. I just want to know what's there and know what exists. But it can be really overwhelming, especially just because, like, this is not what Western society teaches us, right? Western society, which we can speak to because we live in the United States, is all about only showing the good parts, right? It's like highlight reel, okay. Sunday best. Only it's show the Instagram. parts of you that... <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like where we spend 99% mm-hmm. of our time. Because we're and old. don't show the part. Right, 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 right. <laughs> right. For the millennials only. Right. <laughs> we're not just me. So we're only on TikTok like a few hours a day. <laughs> but it's true. Like this is the world that we've grown up in, in particular in the United States. It values so much the perfection, the achiever accumulation and wealth and success and it doesn't like to shine a light on failure and the icky parts and the ugly parts and and actually I think that we're seeing that a lot this year we are shining a light on our shadow like we are coming into that shadow year this year in 2020 and so it's interesting to see how that's how that might change and affect our society in general but in this episode, we're going to talk about sort of like diving into shadow work. And we sort of talked around shadow, but just to reiterate, shadow is the elements of our personality or who we are that we've repressed in our subconscious. It's not the aspects that we like show up with on a first date or even that we show the world. We might not even be in awareness of what is in our shadow because it's in our subconscious or unconscious mind. It's not what we necessarily associate with ourselves. And we've sort of like repressed these or dissociated this, these parts of ourselves because we learned from society, from our parents, from our friends, from our teachers or the people who are immediately in our lives, our relationships, that there were aspects of ourselves that were unacceptable. So we had to hide them away. So basically, you show up as this little brilliant baby 
this little being, 100% full, right? Showing 100% of yourself. And slowly, as you learn how to be a human being in this world, you learn that, oh, like 20% of you is not that dope. Like you really should be embarrassed about that. And so you effectively like cut it off and you hide it away and you forget that it even exists because you go so long not relating to it, not thinking about it, trying to like shove it under your bed, right? Your metaphorical bed. And that's what shadow is. It's the aspects of ourselves that we've repressed and that we've ignored. And after a while, imagine like an animal, right? If you like just throw an animal in the basement in the dark by itself and you like forget about it, it becomes wild. It becomes unmanageable. It becomes dangerous. And when our shadow goes unchecked is when it can become dangerous because it starts to get a life of its own and it starts to be something that we can't control. And so it shows up in really uncomfortable ways in our lives, potentially in ways that are harmful to us or to other people because we're not in awareness of it. So what a shadow work is trying to do is get us familiar and comfortable with these shadows, you know, with the animal in the basement in the dark. And keep it wild, but at least have some knowledge of it and how it works and how it might show up at your party, right? So you know how to tame it when it does come out. So it's not surprising. So it doesn't ruin your relationships or your life. So it's something that you're in relationship with all the time. And like, you know, we can't really control anything. When we try to control, that's when things get even worse. But when we're in awareness and we can respond to our shadow and instead of trying to repress it and like keep it down and shame ourselves for having it, we can see it and acknowledge it and need it presently and respond to it. We have a much more full life. Does that make sense? Yeah. It all makes, <laughs> I'm listening to you and I'm like, everything you're saying right now, one is highlighting and I'm going to say this in the most loving kind of, kind of way to myself. It's highlighting everything that like I'm not currently aligning with in the shadow work right now it's making 100 percent sense yes please continue (laughs) okay great great and like you know we'll talk about what comes up in shadow in a little bit but you know it's just the parts of us that we've repressed but that doesn't mean it's the just bad parts of us right like we repress the gold in us because really societally we want to fit in Society tells us we're safe if we don't, like, shine, if we kind of can, like, go under the radar and just live a normal life and, like, be hetero and have a husband or a wife and have 2.5 kids and have a two-car garage, like, whatever. That's safe because people won't see you and potentially not like you. You can just sort of keep floating through life. And anything that makes us special, that makes us stand out, which can be like the best parts of us, you know, what we're most talented at, like what we're obsessed with, our special gifts, if you're intuitive or psychic or something else. I don't know if you're like amazing at math. Maybe that's a shadow, but the gold, the things that make us special, that make us unique, tend to be the things that we hide in our shadow because we just want to be normal. Think of like how you felt when you were 13, right? Like you just wanted to be like everyone else. You didn't want to stand out. And that's kind of what shadow can hold for us. So shadow can be the negative, nasty parts of us or the things that we deem nasty. Really, they're all neutral, but perhaps like, oh, I'm a bitch or I'm controlling or I have like deep shame or I'm too much, right? I'm too emotional. But it can also be the things that make us so special and amazing and really like what we call the gold. So it could be your intuition. It could be your psychic abilities. It could be like that huge loving heart that you have. It could be like your extreme talent in art or in science or in raising children that you just are sort of hiding under the surface. And that's the shame. That's the horrible thing about living with shadow sort of like looming over us and unacknowledged is that, yes, we ignore parts of us that maybe feel messy, but we also are ignoring the parts of us that make us gold the so important i can't even articulate like the the most important parts of us it makes me want to cry like okay so does that make yeah. sense <laughs> wow it's really beautiful it's and it's also very real i mean it's it's who you are it's a part of who you are like the best exactly. way I, at least for me that it was really described was through my therapist when she said you know you, you literally are denying yourself 
when you don't look at your shadow side. You can't say that you love yourself and like be and embrace the fullness of who you are and deny a whole part of who you are. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. And so, yeah, it, the shadow, at least I'm learning. And again, I'm really, I'm still really in the thick of this work and on a whole new level. Aren't we all, dude? <laughs> no, yeah. Oh my God. Life work. <laughs> No, yo, just a breath yeah. for that. Life <laughs> work. Just a breath for that. One of the kind of mini shadow exercises that I've done is to write down and think about all of the names or things that you would hate if people called you that when you left the room. Ooh, writing that down. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was like, and mm-hmm. I was thinking about before this call what some of mine are right now, and I've got a whole list. I'm, we don't have to go through that, but <laughs> one of them is kind of that I'm all over the place, that I'm here and there and, you know, everywhere and distracted. And I think it's interesting that you can have different tools, like even human design has helped me come to accept that part of my nature as a gift. So, you know, actually being a jack of all trades in a way is not a negative thing. And there are use cases where having those qualities is really helpful. That's exactly right. That's a really great exercise. And it brings up a good point. Well, it, the exercise of like, yeah, that's defining our shadow, right? It's like, what are you the most afraid of being? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, who do you absolutely not want to be? Because guess what? We all have those elements in us. If we like look at archetypes, we embody infinite archetypes, right? We embody the bully and the high priestess and the queen and the king and the murderer at some points in our lives, right? We embody all these things. And it's the same thing with shadow. Like we all have capacity to be the things that we are the most afraid of. Mm -hmm. And when we sort of like run away from them or try so hard not to be them, we actually like swing the pendulum in the opposite direction. And often we end up becoming those things because we're, we're afraid to even embody like an, an, an iota of them. But another really good exercise that, well, I think that you should try if you want after this would be who are the people that you love and appreciate and look up to the most in the world? What are the qualities that you see in them? Because Carl Jung and Robert Johnson, who is a Jungian analyst, they both say that, the reason that we have heroes and that we have people that we look up to societally is because we as individuals cannot hold our gold, right? Mm -hmm. The things that we love the most about Mm -hmm. us, the personality traits that we admire the most, we have to to sort of project it onto another person in order to accept Mm -hmm. it and to experience it. And really the things that you see in other people, the only reason you can see them is because they're in you Mm -hmm. and, and we just can't accept them. So I think that, that would be a cool exercise for you to try because so much of shadow work is like, it's really been like created as like this negative yeah. thing, like find all the shitty mm-hmm. parts of you. I, and that's like, that's yeah. only half yeah. of them, right? That's definitely what I did at the beginning. And I think I was, I was like, wait, I just feel like <laughs> shit about myself now. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, work. I suck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like, so I'm doing all this work to just realize like I'm a shitty person, but I think one of the things, I think it was Carl Jung or Robert Johnson. Yeah. Where they said something along the lines of realizing you're the hero and the villain in your own story. Mm. And I Mm. think holding both space for both is the ultimate challenge and being like, actually, I could be not like a murderer, but in the archetype sense too, when we talk about accepting that we contain the multitudes that exist within Mm -hmm. the archetypal patterns. I think it's hard to be like, Oh, I'm the hero sometimes and accept Mm -hmm. the goodness. Mm -hmm. I have to say too, I do think that there's something in in regards to finding the shitty stuff, but at least that I'm finding and finding the shitty stuff and then redefining it so that it's not shitty and it actually works in your favor and can you recognize like where and how you can utilize it you know in your life Mm -hmm. or how it shows up that where you know where it serves you i also yes like to your point wallace completely agree in terms of again like we are the all of it and the whole of it i just want to say a quick anecdote last night i did aja aja yeah at Mm -hmm. yeah 
She's amazing. Go listen to the episode podcast episode yes. with Asia. She's amazing. Drop, drop. <laughs> she did a past oh. life regression yes. last night. Oh, oh my God. How was it? Segue, segue. <laughs> how was the past life regression? Was it amazing? I did enjoy it. I needed it. I went in with completely like open expectations. I had done a past life regression before, like years, years earlier with this woman, Stephanie Risley, and was kind of like turned off by the experience. I have to be honest. Not that I didn't want to mm. do it again. I just... Mm-hmm. She was an interesting woman. But this was really, again, I didn't know what to expect. I think I always go into experiences like this, though, wanting the most to happen. So I really (laughs) tried to, like, lower my expectations. But it was really interesting when we went into the regression, a dream came back to me that I had that felt very real at the time that I have a dream. I guess maybe I had a dream, like, a year or two ago. I went back to that dream. And it was, I was like very much in a space in a village and had a role and a presence there in that village. And what I discovered in this, and this feels weird saying this out loud, I have to be honest. So I think that's also part of the reason why I haven't been hesitating. But what I discovered in that or what it felt like was that I was in that village as somebody as a holder of knowledge that I was getting from the community elder. And that community elder happened to be my grandmother. And every night under the stars, she would teach me what <laughs> lessons and like and pass yeah. lessons to me. And the community knew that I was to like be the next sort of holder of that. And in my dream, uh, Simba, happen- hello? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my mind was just like, oh my God. Simba, you are the chosen one. It feels like it. And I was underneath the stars and the constellation was beautiful. And then she had us like walk through this window and the window was like in the middle of like the sky that I like got to just walk through. It was amazing. But I just, yeah, oh, I think I, what I discovered was I think I was in my dream. And not, this didn't happen in the restaurant in the dream. I was murdered. I was actually, I was like, they, I had to hide. And these people, I just remember them wearing um, black horses and being in all black. And I knew they were coming to take me. I was very scared. I knew that they had killed, like, my family. And so going back to that in the regression, I was very, I was like, oh, God, what's going to happen? And I saw the light side of that. But it also was, like, a message to me, like, a feeling of, oh, there's a part of you, I feel like, that you hold back that you part of your goodness right the shadow that you don't want to be great because you're afraid of persecution because you've experienced mm-hmm. that before and so that for me really was one of my first or for me at least now I'm still kind of again meditating and discovering that but it's my first peek into something where I feel is a really is the good side of the shadow is the light side of the shadow. I won't even say good or bad because it's neither or but it's the light side of the shadow right. that I've denied of myself you know yeah it's just very interesting very interesting that's really beautiful oh my god Janelle that's so cool it's so astute of you to even just come to that realization in the whatever like 12 hours since you did that regression and I'm sure more will come but that's exactly it right our shadow is really only harmful when it's repressed because it pops up at inopportune times and it controls our behavior without our consent. It drives our behavior without our consent. So you, maybe you've been keeping yourself small because you're afraid of persecution and like that's affected your whole life. And think about maybe all the things that like there was some little part of you, that shadow that was talking that without your permission or without your knowledge that was dissuading you from showing up fully as yourself. And that's like, I think people think that looking at their shadow is going to be scary and break apart their world and like it will harm them, like they're in danger. But the reality is like we're in danger when we're not in awareness of our shadow. Big facts. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Big facts. Really big facts. So some things that we might find in our shadow if we decide to like go down this route, and there are so many ways to do shadow work, but one of the best ways is to just, like do the exercise that Wallace said of writing down the things that you're afraid of becoming or that you're afraid that people think of you or that you really don't like in others. Because in the same way that we project the things that we love and we can't accept in ourselves onto our heroes, we project things and traits and attributes that we really don't like onto other people. And you can sometimes tell that something is shadowy for you when it really dysregulates you, like in a way that you don't understand why it's so 
I don't want to use the word triggering because I don't think that's a great word to use, but where it really causes an emotional activating. reaction for you. Yeah. Or just Yeah. There we go. Activating. Yeah, that's that a great, great word. word. If there's something in your life that is very activating, I'll use an example. I hate arguing with people who like, who just shut down and, and like become really passive. It, infuriates the Italian woman in me. I just like, I become a beast where I'm just like, (laughs) and I can't figure out like what that is that I couldn't figure it out for such a long time. Why I was, I would get so upset. Like that would make me more mad than what we were actually arguing about is when the other person would shut down. And that for me is, has a lot to do with like my shadow around being passive and just like not being in control. So interesting. But these things that dysregulate us, that activate us, there might be some shadow aspect or element in there. Also, we can get dysregulated and activated when someone's being objectively shitty and abusing us. So don't confuse abuse with like you projecting onto somebody else and being activated by them, which I feel like, Wallace, you kind of alluded to that when you were talking about your first initiation into shadow. Yeah. I mean, I have to be honest, one of the things that I was thinking about, I don't know why, when you were talking was one of mine. I'm really afraid of being called like a basic bitch. (laughs) (laughs) I have to be unique. Yeah, it's like a big one for me where I definitely have called people basic, but I also don't like the word. I feel like it's very like minimizing and reductionist and whatever, but I'm terrified that people describe me or something. I don't know. Wallace, I can say you're anything yeah, and, but a basic bitch. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, was going to say <laughs> you're, you're not basic. that. But also, like, what does that represent to you? Like, what does basic bitch, what does that mean? I think it means that you're, like, not critical of the world around you and you're kind of just, like, I don't know, just going with the flow and not questioning things and the status quo is good for you. And I, I think that you got to be critical of all aspects of your life to a certain degree, like not when it tips over into the dark, which I think I can. So it's very complex. What would it mean to not be critical? Like what would that, what's underneath that? Honestly, I think I would probably experience more joy sometimes. Like, just enjoy certain yeah. things. Like, the Netflix movie, The Holiday, was really That's enjoyable. So <laughs> oh. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> you know. And, and so I think it's just accepting that I got some basic B in me, and that is not a bad thing. We all do. Yeah, and... Maybe also the basicness and not looking around you and just kind of accepting the status quo. Does that maybe like represent a level of privilege to you or like ignorance? Yeah. I didn't think about it that way, but for sure. Yeah. And then what would that mean if you had privilege? Like what do you associate with that or ignorant, like willful ignorance? Like an unfairness, even though I absolutely have a ton of, privilege in my life and have grown up with a ton of privilege I think it means willful ignorance means man I don't know I gotta think about this deeper (laughs) yeah yeah and like it completely depends on you and your experience of who you call like basic bitches right and like what that means to you but that's what shadow work is it's just like oh why do I think that's bad right like Is it that I don't want to be, like, vapid? Is it that I don't want to be, like, just someone who has a ton of privilege and who's not in awareness of it? There are so many different things, right? Like, what does it say about me? And that's kind of the the point of going down shadow is at points in our lives, we're all these things, right? Like, I'm hella vapid sometimes. Mm. Yeah, I'm super (laughs) vain sometimes. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. And there are times where that works for us, too, right? Like, when you care about your appearance, I mean, undoubtedly, people treat you a different way when you look put together, right? Like when you put on makeup and you walk into a store, Mm -hmm. people are going to treat you differently. And there could be times in your life where being vain is actually like really helpful Mm -hmm. in progressing you forward. And like, that's what you need. And you kind of need to like tap on your vanity in that moment and put on, on some lipstick and a cool outfit and like get shit done. But it can't control us, and that's the thing about it can't be, like, the the key driver in everything that we do. That's the work. I also think it comes from now, just as you said, that I was thinking about 
being raised in a very kind of like academic fo- focused family mm. where it was like, mm. don't you dare ever rely on your looks. Like that is not okay. And I, I was always shamed for liking fashion and being into mm. anything that would play upon my appearance and my mom was always like you know before I left the house she was like you can't wear that tank top like you need to go get a sweater whatever it was so uh-huh. it was always kind of it was always just like kind but of mom like, it's 90 degrees <laughs> yeah, yeah she's like you can sweat it's fine but yeah there was a lot of fear around me as a kid I was I'm the only girl of three and I think there was a lot of fear of like oh she's gonna rely too much on her looks or something I don't I think it's obviously all unconscious but I remember these things as a kid where it was like I liked fashion and I liked design and I liked clothing and of course my my parents are designers so they're the biggest hypocrites and they're like no don't be into anything aesthetic yeah (laughs) right and so you went into film and like taking beautiful pictures because that's maybe an accept what you thought could be acceptable in terms of creating beauty in the world right or being beautiful totally 100 percent whoa guys therapy session (laughs) and this is why you are the way you are wallace (laughs) just so you know Love shadow work. Uh, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being our guinea pig, Wallace. Well, so oh, great. But that was ready. a perfect example of like, you know, it's kind of, you kind of have to just follow the trail and see where it goes, right? There's no perfect way to do shadow work. You kind of can't really do it wrong unless you're not going for it. Like you kind of just have to like see what's, what's up for you. And every time you do shadow work, like, Maybe you'll revisit this idea or concept in a year the next time you listen to this podcast and you'll have a different breakthrough around what beauty or design or vanity or being a basic bitch means to you. And then you'll work through that. And and the goal is to integrate these parts of ourselves and to just see them and hold them and sometimes be able to move from them if we want 2021 to. 2021 is um, my basic bitch year. <laughs> yes, embrace the basic bitch. Yeah. And I have to say, I have to say that, at least for me, I think I'm actually saying this to myself. So there's a lot happening in my house right now. And this, I'm saying this to myself, that ease. Because I know mm. I'm a Virgo. I'm extremely pedantic. I will analyze the shit out of everything. And it causes a lot of anxiety for me. And so I have to constantly remind myself that, Yes, we're doing shadow work. Yes, it's there's a work attached to it, you know, the word. But ultimately, this is what we're here for, I think, right? This is my opinion. This is what we're here for. This is part of the game of, like, life and the experience that we're here for. And so in that, the stakes aren't really super high, you know, in that yeah. it's it really – is about the experience that you want out of it, that you want to have. And if you're focused on that, you're focused on feeling good and, and letting it be easy, shadow work will unfold for you. That's what. That's how I feel. And I'm telling myself that because, again, I'm in the middle in the thick of it and, like, starting over on day one today. Yeah. That's, that's my feeling on it. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot, too. Yeah, like, you don't have to do, anyone listening to this, you don't have to fucking do shadow work. Like, no one's going to come knock on your door and, and like, force you to look at, at yourself. That's whatever. But, yeah, like, this is a game of life. I think that we chose to be in these bodies in this time. We chose our lives. We chose our parents. And, like, to what end? What is there to find here? And what's there to learn? And... Yeah, there are so many perks of doing shadow work, you know, beyond getting to know yourself better. But ease, I think, Janelle, you hit the nail on the head. It gives us more ease because it it broadens our perception. It helps us see more of the world and understand more of the world. So it doesn't feel like we're we're flying blind. We feel like, oh, okay, I kind of know what's coming up. I know what's going on here. And that helps me navigate it, even if I don't have, like, the exact right answer for how I'm going to act in any situation if my shadow does flare up, at least I see it and I know that that's what's happening and I can go from there as opposed to being blindsided by it. So doing shadow work can like give you just more freedom of choice to be who you are and to choose how you want to show up in the world as opposed to passively like letting shadow guide you or drag you in one direction or another. It gives you healthier, better relationships because when we have personal sovereignty, which comes from knowing our shadow, 
we can show up more fully and honestly, we can pick better partners. Mm. We can pick better people to mm. be with because we can take a hundred percent responsibility for ourselves and we know what we're like what we're game for and also like what we absolutely will not stand for and mm -hmm. why it gives us more self-love it gives us more empathy for ourselves which we all need and like and all, also more empathy for others because when we see someone else who's being dysregulated by their shadow and that's like flaring up for them we can see that that's not the person right like you are not your shadow your shadow is just an element of you so when I see like, oh, my partner's shadow is flaring up right now, instead of getting mad at him or her, I can be like, how can I help you work through this? How can I support you through this experience? Because, and love you and love this part of you too. And then finally, like, it's all about being the most whole version of ourselves, which I, I feel like what we, what we do at holisticism is just like, how can I live the most full, whole, complete life? And when we can embrace ourselves 100%, all the aspects of who we are, that's the definition of, of wholeness. The image that just kept coming up for me, thinking about being kind of driven by your shadow instead of being aware of it and, and working through that stuff is where we're at with driverless cars right now. Mm. <laughs> so it's, yeah, yeah. Let's I'm go with this balls. metaphor. Go, yes. Bring us there. Bring oh us there, God. Alice. <laughs> Well, it's just like we're in this stage with driverless cars where they're trying to re rely on this AI that is not really complete yet. Like, they haven't figured it out. So it's like running. They keep hitting people. Yeah. It's, not it's like sometimes it works. Most of the time it doesn't still. Right down and, so, and so it's running on, I feel like the AI right now, at least, is our unconscious. So we're just like, whatever, like, we're going, we're driving, and then we're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. We had a car here. <laughs> oh, shit. Go into the wrong lane there. But still trying to move forward with this kind of running on automatic and being able to take a step back and be like, mm, okay, maybe this code is not there yet. And maybe I need to mm. intervene a little bit and work on the, the unconscious instead of just letting it run the show. Oof, yes. Yo, that's a perfect example because the thing that improves AI technology is more data. It's more information. And that's what intuition is just information, right? And so is shadow work. It's just more information about who we are. It's more data to input into the cloud or into the like whatever AI algorithm so that you understand the topography of like what you're navigating, which is just life or like, I don't know the roads in LA, if you are <laughs> listening to this podcast. The, the but, yeah, that's such ways. a good example. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. That's perfect. Well, I know we want to wrap up, but I think that there's two important things that I want to touch on before we, like, put the nail in the coffin on this pod, which is, like, so just some rule, general, like, life rules for shadow work and exercise to start with. So yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool. So I think there's, like, generally six rules. And full disclosure, I am pulling this from a module that we did in the North Node on shadow work. That's a five-day shadow work challenge that was life-changing. So that's in the North Node. If if you want to dive deeper into shadow work, I'll give you some more resources. But heads up that that's available if that's something that you're into. So the first rule is don't run away from your hurt. Your feelings and what comes up for you are not a problem. They're not an inconvenience and they're not an anomaly. Don't try to shrug off the deep feelings that you might have. Feelings like shame, grief, like inner child, like deep wounding, resistance, anger, all of these like big things that we try to often like dole down and like turn the volume down on, they can come up during shadow work and just accept them for what they are, even if you can't rationalize them. If you're like, I don't know why I'm just absolutely fucking furious at the guy in front of me at Starbucks. Like that's okay. Just like see it and don't run away from it. Second rule is give yourself some spaciousness when you're doing shadow work, either before you thoughtfully and consciously enter a shadow work exercise or when you're meditating on it for yourself. Just notice a little bit more stillness between those moments because this is really deep work. It's like it's like running a marathon for your unconscious. It's like you need rest and you need to nourish yourself. And I think also being really well resourced in your life 
in terms of having support and having spaciousness and not having everything else in your life be up, like be up for grabs. Having a little bit of groundedness in your life creates a really great space to do shadow work. So if you're not feeling like that right now, if you're feeling like everything's going wrong or everything is stressful, then it, it might maybe like pump the brakes on the shadow work for the time being or do do like a light version. And you can always go deeper when you're feeling more resourced and perhaps more safe. The third thing I would say is witness everything with curiosity as opposed to trying to like judge what comes up for you or like diagnose it. Just be in relationship to whatever comes up without identifying it or avoiding it or like putting a label on it. Just huh, that's interesting. I like to say that to myself, like, hmm, interesting, fascinating. Okay, who are you? That's cool. Let's see what's there. The fourth thing I would say is give yourself to be in a freedom to be in a state of just not knowing, not ignorance. So not like you're avoiding, but just openness to not really know what this could mean for you to not really know where it's coming from, but to just see that it's there. And you don't need to be right. You don't need to be smart. You don't need to work through this quickly in order to be lovable. You just need to be open to seeing it. That's it. There are going to be some moments that don't have a resolution and that will feel very unknown. And they might feel really unknown for a really long time. And that's okay. The fifth thing, this is super, super important. Shadow work is not the same as supervised therapy or working through traumatic experiences with a licensed professional. Although shadow work can be awesome to do on your own, it can also be really helpful to do with a licensed professional or in conjunction with seeing a therapist, especially if you're working through traumatic experiences. And then finally, number six, you have choices about many things in your life including how you perceive your circumstances. But one thing that we can't positive thought away is something like structural oppression. So that doesn't really fall into the realm of shadow work, right? Things like racism, sexism, heterosexism, cissexism, classism, ableism, all of these things exist. They aren't like something that you can do shadow work on to obliterate. But we can potentially do shadow work on our relationship to those sites of structural oppression or how they personally conditioned us in the way that we show up in the world. So that's my six sort of heavy rules. <laughs> but <laughs> so what do you think? Should we go into an exercise that people can try at home, guys? Yes, those were good rules. I think one thing I thought was interesting is you're <laughs> comment about not doing the work when your world's on fire. Yep. But I feel like that's mm -hmm. whenever I'm called to it. I'm like brought to my knees <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, what's wrong with me? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Like, it, and that's, that's normal, right? When we have endings in death, the death card, Scorpio, the Scorpio season of our lives, which is like when we're coming to an ending or like things are falling apart all around us. We want to fix them. We want to come back into wholeness. And that's normal. Like, we want to triage the situation. If we feel like our arm has just been cut off, like, we want yeah. to stop the bleeding. We want to fix it. And we should, right? If you if your arm falls off, you should definitely stop the bleeding. Like, put a tourniquet on. And, like, you're not going to try and go to physical therapy the next day to figure out how to live your life like as an amputee, right? You're going to have some, like, you're going to, Take some time to recover, to acclimate to this new normal, to see how you feel, to not rip open those stitches, that fresh wound. And then when you're feeling ready, you're not going to be 100% healed, but then you'll start to think about like, okay, how do I maybe like walk around in my life with one arm? What does that look like now? How can I do this? How can I <laughs> drive my car and open the door and I don't know, make my coffee in the morning? And I think it's normal to want to, like, get out of pain as soon as possible yeah. and get out of discomfort as soon as we possibly can when we're going through heartache or even a traumatic experience. And, and, so, and there's so much beauty and magic in going slow and, like, letting it unfold and not trying to fix immediately. And um, Say that one more time. Yeah. Just for me. Just for me. 
Just say it one more time so I can I can like sleep in. I can take the lesson and finally use it. Please. I feel my resistance being like, no. Fix it now. No, it right. must be fixed. Like, but I want to be perfect tomorrow. Like, come on. Yeah. Right. Totally. And like, I'm the same way. As soon as something goes wrong, I'm like, how can I just fix this and get on track? Ugh. And like, that's not the point. It's not to like get on the same track. It's to find a different pathway. And sometimes that takes more time. So, I mean, like, I think this is the same thing with actually like, especially if you're if you're doing work around money Mm. uh, if you're doing shadow work around money because you have to go so deep in yourself and into like the shadows and and in the depths of the unknown and and maybe like some things that are really really scary that you've been hiding for a really long time that you've been repressing for a very long time to keep yourself Mm. safe or to keep yourself lovable that it can be overwhelming if we try to like bite it off in, in one piece So making sure that you have, that you feel well-resourced, and that doesn't mean that everything has to be perfect in your life or that you have to be 100% quote-unquote healed. It just means, like, let's get some stitches on the gushing wound first. Let's take a breath. Let's take a beat. And then if you want to go into the shadow work, like, absolutely do it. But make sure that you've got support around you, either, like, you know, your family or your friends, people that you trust that you can do the work with, or a therapist if you've got someone awesome who can help you because it can feel like the world is crumbling underneath, like the ground underneath you is crumbling when you're doing shadow work. So you have to have those, like, branches that you can hold on to or something that you can root to to make sure that you're going to be okay but also, like, do whatever you want, you know? Uh, that's just my recommendation. Like, if you just want to go balls to the wall, like, l- burn it all down, bro. Burn like, it cards, all do down. It. <laughs> and we'll rebuild. It'll be lovely. It'll be great. You're going to survive either way. You're going to survive either way. It's just, like, do we always have to be, like, flagellating ourselves constantly? Like, self-work doesn't have to be painful. Oh. <laughs> it just doesn't. Oh. Like it can be enjoyable and like delicious and luxurious and fun. It doesn't have to be like you hating yourself because honestly, that's just another part of shadow. Like you punishing yourself. Like that's more of the same, mm-hmm. you know, hundred percent. Yeah. That's that ego like right the, there. The positive, the hero exercise that you mentioned before. Yeah. Well, thanks. I like mm-hmm. you. Too. I didn't come up with it. <laughs> but that, that is a perfect segue, and we'll wrap up this episode. I know we went a little bit long, but first off, three great places to learn more about shadow work are three awesome books that I so, so, so strongly recommend. And I personally have not found a shadow work course out there or teacher singular teacher who really like dives into all of these elements. I think most people tend to tend to be in the negative around shadow. And these are the OGs of talking about shadow work in the sort of wellness mystical space. So The Dark Side of Light Chasers by Debbie Ford is an incredible book. If you want to do shadow work, buy this book or get it from your library or get the audiobook. It is life-changing and it has tons of exercises in it. And like every shadow work course that I've seen is based off of this book and it like basically pulls the the exercises from this book and and you have to pay a lot more for it so check out the dark side of light chasers another great book is gold mining the shadows by pixie lighthorse who's an incredible author this book is super readable you can get through it in about an hour and it's basically just one or two page chapters on concepts and ideas around shadow work so if you're still like what the fuck is shadow work go check that out i think it'll be really helpful to you i basically highlighted the entire book because it's that good so strong recommend on that and then the last book that i would recommend is called romancing the shadow by connie seawig and it is all about understanding shadow in yourself and other people especially in relationship and it's really great also a super fast read so if you want to go you know quick and dirty gold mining the shadows and romancing the shadow if you want to like really go balls to the wall dark side of light chasers is is where to start but let's talk about one exercise actually we'll just make this exercise into a pdf so you can download this worksheet 
at holisticism.com backslash shadow, and it'll pop up for you. It's free. And this is one of the first exercises actually in our five day shadow work challenge that we do in the North Node. And it's a really great place to start. If you are like a little bit confused as to what shadow work is and you wanted to explore it for yourself deeper, check this out at holisticism.com backslash shadow. It's a bunch of questions to ask and it'll get you on the right path. So you can go download that at holisticism.com backslash shadow. Well, this is so fun. I mean, now I like want to go and do shadow work again for myself. Although I will say, I think shadow is something you should do maximum every six months. I don't think that you should do shadow work, like a deep dive into shadow work every single month because that's a lot, but I'm due. I last time I did shadow work was July. So this is a pretty good time, especially like moving into 2021. If you want to just like up level in everything that you do, Bro, take yourself through some shadow work. That'll that'll clear out the cobwebs. Yeah, that's necessary. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very necessary. And again, <laughs> here's the thing. I just want to say this last thing. We are going into 2021. Everybody's like, oh, my God, I can't wait for this year to be over. You know, it's been a, a hell of a... It doesn't just stop when we go, go into the new year. So this is the time. Right. This is the perfect time to be doing this work because we don't know what's coming and what it's going to look like on the outside. Mm-hmm. But as long as we can navigate what's happening on the inside we're gonna be all right you know what i'm saying that's right, time be is all right. right. that's right time <laughs> is a lie time does not exist <laughs> it's a construct <laughs> yeah, we just want to be comfortable <laughs> You guys, I was trying to explain to Ethan last night that time isn't a delusion that we are all complicit in. And he was looking at me like I fucking lost my mind. I was like standing on the couch like, it's an illusion. It's not real. And he was like, you can't. No, we're not having this conversation. <laughs> we're talking about spaghetti and meatballs. Like, why are you bringing this up? You know? And I mean, I just think about daylight like, savings time. That whole the whole concept of, of it makes no sense. So like there, also, everything's just made February. up. Also February. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on. Just every also four years, just months. Or yes. Months. Why 30 days? Why 31 days? Like, just yeah. why? It's all well, the, the moon, no? The moon's 28. Sure. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's why February knows what's up. <laughs> exactly. One month. Exactly. Every four years. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everyone looks at February like it's problematic, yeah. but everybody's like, I don't know what the fuck y'all are on. And we got, we got a black history. <laughs> oh. <laughs> black history gets shortchanged. I know days, it does. every fucking year. Well, sorry, we don't live it out all year. It's all yeah. good. Exactly. All good. exactly. Yes, <laughs> all year. <laughs> cool guys. Well, this is so fun. Thanks for revealing your shadows. This is great. I'm like, should we all reveal a shadow element that we're working on? But I feel like Please, I will. I'm maxed out, guys. I think we know what's going on for me. (laughs) (laughs) I have a lot to work on. I I have to get this out of my my chest just to say, because I've been wanting to actually say this the whole podcast. I am dealing really seriously with being judgmental and condescending. Ooh, wait, tell me more about that. I, well, one, I recognize I have a lot, a lot of work to do and, and doing a lot of work around self-worth and like feeling just enough. And a, a lot of how I recognize, at least recently, that that shows up for me, particularly in my relationship, is like through judgment and through judgment of like the other person. And I, that only is happening because I, I'm judging myself. And I recognize it because I'm doing it all the time. And I'm and I'm I'm mean to myself and I'm nasty to myself. And so I'm recognizing those elements pop up like really consistently, obviously, to show me that, you know, for myself and for in order for me to be able to work through it and get to a place of fully being able to love myself unconditionally and, you know, embracing the wholeness of who I am. But those are like I am actively when I say actively. I'm actively working on that right now in my shadow. And so, yeah, so there's that. And yeah, those are, those are the major elements. Last night, I, I think was the first time again, the element of like really holding back a, a part of myself came up. So I think I just need to meditate on that a little bit more, but I've been in the throes of working on some, some uh, darker side of the shadow for the last couple months. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a really and good one. Especially with the way that we interact with the internet and social media right now, I feel like that's probably a really common one for people in general. Yeah, because there's a disconnect. Time. 
Yeah. There's a little bit of a disconnect. There's, I think, more ability to be a little bit removed for how you are affecting the other person and, and how you're not dealing with the other person. And so, yeah, I think that definitely does make it easier. Yeah. I, I don't I have no answers. I'm literally all, I'm just full of openness and questions. <laughs> But I'm on the journey. Same, I'm dude. On journey. Same. Thanks for sharing yeah, that. Thank you. My shadow that I'm working on right now is I recently I used to I used to be a modern dancer and a choreographer, and this year I started taking piano lessons because I just wanted to learn how to play the piano, and I really want to like write music <laughs> and I don't have a good voice and like I'm super shy and all the things but I really want to start like writing songs and I also get mortified when other people sing music like when they make music and they perform it it makes me so embarrassed for them and so that's how I know that this is shadow for me because it like I want to throw up when I see like acoustic guitar players singing on stage like you know at a bar or something I'm like I, I'm so embarrassed for you and there's something in me that's like but I want to do that so I'm getting over my embarrassment and like judgment around and just shame around like making music and making art and showing it to the world so that's but it's really scary. <laughs> that is some of the best. Like, like that is amazing yeah. shadow work because we yeah. all need art always. And exactly. like, I think that is the wave of our healing in the future, honestly, or like in our present. So, yes, keep doing that work. Yeah, that self-expression. <laughs> I can't wait. Well, I'm just I can't wait to hear it. So yeah, no pressure. Same. <laughs> no pressure. Same. But oh my god, I don't know. Collab. I have to commit to. I really have to commit to let's, it. <laughs> let's do a collab. Let's drop an album. Let's do so. Like I, <laughs> no, seriously. One of the things I want to learn this year also is how to make beats, like how to make music. Yeah. Yeah, but my, dude, let's start a band. Yeah. You guys, let's oh, start I'm a so band. <laughs> so this is a talent show. <laughs> yeah, I think we were um, we're ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but my my shadow around that is, is people being like, oh, you have too many, like, interests. You, you're going to, like, start and then give up and whatever. I mean, I, I see that. I'm not saying no to your shadow, but, <laughs> yes, like, uh, I don't – I'm so impressed, like, just to give you an outside perspective, and Ethan's an MG, too. I'm so impressed with people who can do lots of things and have all these amazing interests and like pick them up when they want to and leave them behind when they don't as someone who like is excessive around what like I'm an obsessive person like I can only focus on one thing at a time and I have to do it to the like oomph degree so I'm so impressed by people who are like I have a passing interest in a thing it's fine I don't need to dedicate my entire life to it like that's so much cooler to me than what I do <laughs> so I think you're great <laughs> well I need to do some work on accepting because I'm like why can't I just have single focus passion because you're not exactly boring. that's not meant for you <laughs> that's not meant for you <laughs> no like you're, you're not better. boring anyway Guys, this is great. I've got a lot of shit to work this on. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. Damn, I'm like, I gotta go journal. Like, I gotta go. I'm gonna go cry into my soup. <laughs> I'm with you, Wallace. I'm with you. I'll cry with you. And we'll make it through. Well, thanks for sharing your, your darkness and your light with us, guys. And thank you, listeners. You can download the shadow worksheet at holisticism.com backslash shadow. And we'll see you next week for the pod. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. Hi. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> so it's me, Michelle, uh, here with the whole Holisticism team for our weekly meeting. And I'm presenting our Witch of the Week today. So I kind of had a really hard time picking one person, but I'm going to try and like narrow my focus and make it one person. So my witch this week is Scott Cunningham and Scott. So let me tell you the backstory. So I've been out of LA for like a month and I have a garden and someone else was watching my garden while I was gone. And I came back and it was beautiful and all my herbs were like looking great. And it just like 
it is my peak witchy moment is like planting herbs in the garden and then like harvesting them and using them in teas and spells and giving them to people. Um, and I learned a lot. Yeah, that's my favorite thing. I also feel like a grandma when I'm doing it and it's fine. So I was looking for some new herbs to grow in the garden because I had to get rid of my broccoli plants, as you do when it's better. <laughs> And I was looking for this book by Scott Cunningham, and it's called Magical Herbalism. And this book is amazing, and I think I must have given it to someone, and it's gone. So I actually have two Witches of the Week, Scott Cunningham and someone else. But this book's incredible. Scott Cunningham was this dude in the 50s who became obsessed with Wicca and magic and herbalism. And I love that for him. Yeah, I love his book titles. I was just, I just Googled him really quickly. Yeah, he's got like a classic, The Truth About Witchcraft Today, which I definitely want to check out from the library because it sounds hilarious and amazing. Mm. But he kind of was like, you know, part of the Wicca craze or fad that came about in the 70s in the United States and studied with a bunch of sort of famous Wiccans and occultists like Raymond Buckland, who's written a lot of books about Wicca. I'm not super big into Wicca, but these people are really well known. And part of why Wicca is so well known is because they wrote so many books about it and really popularized it. But Scott Cunningham's book on the Magical Encyclopedia of Herbs is just like this amazing, weird book that talks about all the herbs and plants that you would have in your in your own you know, grimoire or in your cabinet for witchcraft and wizardry, but also the meaning of herbs magically when you grow them, when you ingest them, when you use them in spells. I just find that to be so cool, especially because herbs are such an accessible and plants are such an accessible point to magic. And even like the fact that they grow in the dark from seeds, like it's just amazing. That is magic. That's that's being a green witch. So I love this book and I think I gave it to someone and I don't have it anymore. So I was looking for another book because I was researching some herbs that I wanted to grow in my own garden. Because if you take on the moniker of a witch or you take on the identity of a witch, one thing that you can do is grow your own herbs and that strengthens your own sort of magic. If you grow them around your home. It also offers you protection. So even having like little herbs that grow on your stoop or in your window can be a nice practice for you. I was checking out another book that I have called The Green Witch by Erin Murphy Hissick. And it's a great book. It's really accessible and thoughtful. And a lot of these old Wicca books are like not super thoughtful and kind of weird. And I just love how Erin talks about everything from a really, you know, more woke perspective, for lack of a better word. So I'm just like really luxuriating and enjoying herbalism and green witchcraft. So my two witches of the week are Scott Cunningham and Erin Murphy Hiscock. Nice. Yeah. Love yeah. That. I absolutely love that. Also, first thing I'm doing when I go home is planting right? some herbs in my front yard. I'm <laughs> sure I'm herb garden too now Done. that I'm home because I was afraid to yes. leave them to somebody. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been in your garden, Michelle, and then I was just like, oh, damn, this is a real garden. This is not like no magazine garden because I thought I was just going to go and like pick something. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, this is for real. So then I was like intimidated and then picked a flower instead. And I did put that on my altar and I was just like because it was the color that I wanted and I wanted a hibiscus and it was just like wait she has like these pink hibiscuses here so I used one of those but your garden is like for real there were ants on that has hibiscus <laughs> it's alive what? yeah it's not pretty I mean like it's beautiful but it's like wild you know but it's also like real I was like oh this is real <laughs> It's very real. The raccoons that eat my Brussels sprouts, also very real. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Brussels. Oh, my gosh. Brussels sprouts. That's the, Yeah, it sounds <laughs> delicious, actually. I'm, Do, are those winter crops? That's very random. I, do, I literally just thought about growing Brussels sprouts. I feel like they're the like winter. a fall harvest, at least on the East Coast. Yeah. Okay. I mean, California is a bit weird. Really you can kind of grow a lot, like, for a lot of the year. Some winter, mm-hmm. like, a lot of leafy greens are actually, like, you could plant them right now in California. So same thing with it's actually a really good time to plant cauliflower and Romanesco. So if you want to do that, you can. <laughs> mm, <laughs> yeah. right. um, 
I'm picturing you in your garden listening to the vinyl. Have you have you guys ever listened to Plantasia? Yep. The vinyl? Mm-mm. It's hilarious. Mm-mm. It's so good. The title is Plantasia, Warm Earth Music for Plants and the People Who Love Them. <laughs> I love it's that. It's such a good vinyl. I, that, that's a real yeah. thing. That's amazing. I do, we just recently discovered actually when I created a little small garden in my backyard, my mom was taking care of it when I went on vacation and she was trying to heal the tomatoes because they were having a really hard time. She found music, meditation music specifically wow. for tomatoes and played it out loud outside. She would sit outside for 30 minutes every day Did with them work? and play the tomato music for them. Yeah, well, for for a short time. I think after a while, those tomatoes were just done. But they did. I mean, they they kept growing. They were lively. They were strong. They had they went through phases. Those, those tomatoes had a I think a rough <laughs> childhood. But you kept them alive That's while impressive. I was away. And so yeah, that, that was pretty. That's incredible. some niche yeah. meditation recommendation right there. Very niche. Yeah. Plant specific. <laughs> very, very wow. specific. Yeah. I wonder yeah. how many downloads that gets. Like, how many people are listening to that? No, a lot because I've been doing like niche meditations also and the things I'd be looking up like, well, actually I look for regular things like opening up your sacral chakra. So everyone's doing that. So maybe not. (laughs) (laughs) Well, but everyone in, at least in LA started a garden during the pandemic. So I'm I'm sure at least it got discovered a lot over the past few months. People were like, oh, we can send vibrations specifically to our, our produce. Which is amazing. And also, when you think about it, it makes total sense. 100%. You know? It does. Little side note, I also started the rice experiment recently because I wanted to see it for myself. Talking, you know, I, I labeled one with love, another one with hate. And I actually labeled a third one with hate to change over to love mm-hmm. halfway in the month to see how that responds. Yeah. And so just to think about how, again, energy, words, everything is like vibration affects the physical things that we see around us, especially things that... What are your results so far? So it's actually only been two weeks and obviously I've been <laughs> gone for one of those weeks. <laughs> so I'll see when I get back. I had my mom and my partner kind of whisper a couple of things, uh-huh. but I think they probably haven't been spoken to in the last few days. So when I get back, I'll get back on it and we'll, I'll let you know in the next uh, oh few God. podcasts. Yes, I, I need, to see this need another bowl for neglect. All I'm saying is put on Plantasia. You and your plants will be very happy. Actually, my tomato plants do need this. So now I have to figure out how to pipe music to the tomato plants other than me sitting out there with my phone. Little tiny speakers for all the plants. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Little headphones on them. (laughs) Oh, they'd love that. (laughs) I love seeing y'all talk about, like, gardens and herbs because it's been a dream of mine. And I can just see myself in the Caribbean being able to join in when I have my, like, tropical fruits or whatever I'm growing and just tell you about that and add it. But I've been at like magical properties of herbs and it's really interesting but they're all very they all come from wicca and so for or like the majority of them what i've been seeing and so like that's not my thing so it's just like i wish that there were like multiple options so i could see like how it was used culturally or in my like an african traditional religion but the things that i've been discovering like about like cinnamon for drawing money Mm -hmm. or vanilla for like love or all of the things it's like I wouldn't have thought like oregano did this also you know Mm -hmm. yeah I agree like a lot of the Wicca stuff it comes from Wicca it doesn't come from maybe like I'm Italian so herbalism is a big thing in Italy obviously we have a lot of herbs and in uh, Italian witchcraft there are different meanings for for plants than there are in Wicca but I don't know. I feel like a lot of it, too, is like, what does this plant mean to you? Like when you hold it in your hands and when you smell it and like, mm-hmm. how does it feel when you taste it? And I like herbalism teachers who talk about the plants in that way, who encourage you to like find your own relationship to them and practice with them. And be like, what do you want to use this for? Like, how would you use this in your life? I really appreciate that. It's like intuitive spell casting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. I never thought Mm -hmm. about that. And I'm happy you said that because I was just like, there's rules, there's rituals, there's structure. But I'm just like, that's cool to know that I can like figure it out on my own. That's nice. Yeah. I don't remember their (laughs) name, but I think it was in August we had somebody come on and do a workshop meditation speaking to the plant. Remy. Yeah. From Good Witch NYC. Because, yeah, we had a bunch of herbalism workshops and they were so fucking cool. And, yeah, that was a great class. We, like, talked to the plant and then we danced with the plant. Oh, that sounds awesome. (laughs) That one was, I was in another realm. That was so good. Yeah, that one was great. Yeah. 
That's so cool. Plants are awesome. I love them. And I think one of the coolest things about growing your own garden is, and more, most magical, is when you take your plants and you give them to other people. So, you guys, I have a ton of plants mm-hmm. to give you if you want them. And we could be, yes, we could be plant, plant sister moms. <laughs> Would love that. Let's propagate a whole family. <laughs> <laughs> yes, probably. Yeah, I'm the most yeah. excited about the valerian root, a valerian that I'm growing, and the lemon balm and the yarrow because those are all like really nice, Ooh, nourishing. I love lemon balm. I've never heard of a valerian root. That sounds interesting. It's for psychic powers and dreaming, and it is very like mm. soothing. Same thing with lemon balm. Mm. Like lemon balm is really good mm. for anxiety, and it reminds mm. me of just like brightening up your life like it it just feels good and then yarrow is also like Mm. it's this beautiful pink color you can actually make like mouthwash out of it instead of like (laughs) which is really weird but it's a cool little plant yeah so that's up for grabs if you guys want some definitely cool okay so that's this week's witch of the week and if there are any green witches out there i would love to hear from you Shoot us a text, and uh, if you're growing your own garden, strong recommend on a book from Scott Cunningham or The Green Witch by Aaron Murphy Hiscock. That's it for us this week. Thanks for listening to the 12th House Podcast. Rate, review, and subscribe because it really helps us. (laughs) And if you give us a rating on Apple Podcasts, send us a screenshot, and I'll send you a free little gift. It will be sort of like an ethical bribe. So thank you. We really, really appreciate it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, ethical Love prize. It. Everyone likes an e- <laughs> yeah. Everyone wants an ethical prize. prize. Yeah. I would just say, because you said it was an ethical bribe. Like I'd be like, yeah, she told me what it was, so yeah, I'm about to do it. At least like you told me. <laughs> it's called transparency, folks. That's what we're all about here at Holisticism. Right. <laughs> all that stuff really helps us. And even if you just share the podcast with a friend, it really means a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much for being part of our community. We do this stuff because. It's really fun and we like to share with you and we we love when you get something out of it. So hope you enjoy the podcast today and we'll see you next week. Bye.